So this is the first case. So it's a CT of a 50 year old woman who has got progressive abdominal distension with loss of appetite. Um, she had an ultrasound already, which we're not which we're not looking at, but it showed a lot of ascites. Uh, there's a gross ascites, mental thickening, and uh, I can see that there are omental cakes in the left iliac fossa and also in the right flank. Um, in, the, in the pelvis, um, right, right and next uh, is slightly bulky. Okay. Um, yeah, and the borders are not uh, that well defined. Yeah. Uh, I can't see the left and next are clearly. Uh, right and next up, abnormal. Okay. Um, yeah, in summary, there's a uh, gross uh, ascites, yeah. thickening and caking, bulky left and next up. Okay. Um, and I am looking at the, there are renal cysts, I can see. Liver okay. hasn't got uh, same negative points. No evidence of cirrhosis of the liver. I can't see any gross bowel lesions okay. or um, tumors. No gross lymphadenopathy. Yeah. Uh, okay. My so differential what... would be. Yeah. Differential would be right ovarian malignancy, malignant ascites. Yeah. Findings I have got. Okay. So, um, there aren't any other differentials I can see findings that have got. So I would recommend for patients uh, CE125 and uh, uh, doing MRI pelvis as is uh, admixed lesion further. And okay. uh, omental cake biopsy, ultrasound guided. And also okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. So, I agree that. Um, what we see on the CT right from the very top is a very large volume of um, ascites, um, which is you can see here this free fluid around the liver, but also quite striking nodularity and thickening of the omentum, which we see here, um, particularly in the lower part of the abdomen and pelvis. So we see this really gross thickening, and that's termed a mental cake because the greater momentum becomes infiltrated and thickened with this nodular tissue and it, it's like a cake um, draped over the abdomen and the uh, the gut and so that ascites continues down into the pelvis and then also we see that there is nodularity of some of the mesentery um, a really good place to look for um, nodularity in these kinds of cases is up in the left upper quadrant. This fat generally is supposed to be quite clean. So if you see this kind of streaky nodularity here, that's very good suggestion, uh, very strong indicator that there's some abnormality. And then I agree that in the pelvis here, the right adnexa is abnormal. There is an ill-defined mass. So this, this could be a primary ovarian mass which disem with disseminated peritoneal spread throughout the um, abdominal cavity. And as you say, the next steps would be referring to the appropriate cancer multidisciplinary meeting, uh, some sort of biopsy to get tissue, so an, a mental biopsy is possible, but you'd be cautious about doing that when there's so much ascites around, so there may need to be a drainage uh, in addition. Okay, let's move to the um, next case. So, case number two is a 40-year-old woman who, again, has got abdominal distension um, and weight loss, and uh, her ultrasound also showed ascites. We're not reviewing the ultrasound uh, here in this tutorial. She also has a raised CA125, which is a tumor marker. So the clinical question is, has she got uh, disseminated ovarian cancer, which is what's being suggested from the history and the lab findings? So why don't you talk us through the findings? So axial CT scan in the port of venous face. Um, there is also ascites large volume ascites. Um, also, there is streaky nodularity noted in the momentum with the diffuse peritoneal thickening. Uh, 
So uh, the solid organs, the spleen, pancreas, stomach appears normal, the liver, gallbladder likewise, adrenals, kidneys. So I'm starting to check the ovaries. There is mixed attenuation left ovarian legion. It is mostly cystic with uh, thin enhancing septation. The right ovary, I, I think it's normal. Okay. There is clips of previous sterilization. Uh, so overall, the features are consistent with peritoneal carcinomatosis. Um, and there is suspicion of left adenixial mass. Uh, the bowel loops, uh, I don't see bowel obstruction. Though this small bowel loops uh, in the upper abdomen seems to be tethered. Um, but okay. there is no bowel obstruction. So okay. uh, I would recommend referral this patient to uh, gynecology MDT. Okay. Uh, and also MRI pelvis and possibly a biopsy from the omentum. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So I agree with all of those um, findings. Um, and it, there's a lot of similarities to the previous case that we looked at. So, you know, again, from the very top, we see that um, there is ascites. Just note that there are some soft tissue nodules here in the fat just immediately adjacent to the heart here. And in the upper abdomen, there's a bit of soft tissue here just deep to the diaphragm, um, which they could be lymph nodes. But again, there's ascites, there's marked thickening of the omentum with a nodularity to it. Um, there's also this nodular thickening of the mesentery. Um, and there are these uh, what, uh, adnexal abnormalities, particularly on the left side, similar to the last case where it's not very well defined, okay? Um, and yes, one of the main things to consider is whether or not this is disseminated peritoneal malignancy. Now, in fact, the very first case we looked at was a proven case of peritoneal carcinomatosis due to um, malignancy uh, disseminated everywhere. Whereas the second case we looked at was actually peritoneal tuberculosis. And note that the findings are very, very similar and there is nothing definitive on the CT that will point you to one or the other. Um, but we're going to talk through a few different cases now to try and um, make sure that we understand what all the different appearances of peritoneal tuberculosis are and to make sure that we consider that as a differential when we see this kind of appearance. So the similar features in both of these are, as you can see on these images, a very large volume of fluid, um, ascites throughout the abdominal cavity. There is an enhancing margin to the ascites, um, which would indicate peritoneal inflammation. There's a mental thickening and nodularity and mesenteric thickening and nodularity. So the reason why it's important to think about tuberculosis is because we do see peritoneal TB. So I'm going to present to you some data which is from England, but actually you can apply this to many other parts of um, the world. So if we look at this data from Public Health England, we saw that relatively speaking, there was a flat um, uh, incidence of new cases of peritoneal TB over a long period. And so it was roughly around 12 to 15 cases per 100,000 in the population. But that's in the UK as a whole, whereas we know that um, there are variations geographically. So this tiny red dot here, that's us in Leicester. So we have a higher incidence of TB, in fact, 50 per 100,000 compared to the general UK population. And there are some other known hotspots. If we look in London, northwest London and east London are also hotspots for tuberculosis. And then um, at the tip of this arrow here, that's Luton. Um, that's also another hotspot. OK, so you have to consider your local incidence, which and you can find that data from Public Health England. And then there are some questions you need to ask yourself that would make you think that could should I be suggesting that this could be a case of peritoneal TB rather than peritoneal carcinomatosis? So having considered your local incidence, how old is your patient? So again, this is um, 
data from the UK which shows that patients um, with uh, TB, um, there is an age peak between roughly 18 to about 60. Okay, and the other thing that this graph shows is that the rates are much greater in the non-UK born um, population than UK born population. So we know that um, TB has this devastating economic impact because it affects people of working age. We also know that the vast majority of people are born outside the UK. So in fact, 80% of people are born outside of the um, UK. Now, if we look at some specific Leicester data, we know that in 2011 on the census, they found that a third of people were actually born, uh, living in Leicester were born outside of the UK. And 80% of those were under 35 when they arrive. And 80% of those develop who 80% of people develop TB do so within the first 10 years arriving. So this is a disease of relatively young people, working age, so it's got this economic impact, and of those people, broadly speaking, who have arrived into the UK from um, other parts of the world. And where in the world are they coming from? So this is from the WHO, which shows that the highest incidence of TB are what we already know. So we know that Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, parts of the Pacific are generally those places which have the highest incidence of TB. But if we look at those cases when they're in Leicester, then it's again those same countries. OK, so India, Pakistan, parts of the um, Pacific region and then parts of Sub-Saharan Africa is where those patients are coming from. And then thirdly, do they have any social risk factors? OK, so we know that um, alcohol and drug misuse and homelessness are risk factors that increase the risk of tuberculosis. And then finally, are they immunosuppressed? And in particular, uh, co-infection with HIV is a strong risk factor for developing TB. So 13% of patients who have active TB are co-infected with HIV. And when the CD4 count drops, then um, atypical infections and particularly atypical TB come, in, come into play. Case number three is a young man who's got abdominal pain and weight loss. Talk us through your findings, please. That's likely due to the underlying peritoneal uh, reaction. There's no bowel wall uh, thickening or bowel lesion per se that I can see. It's a moderate burden of sigmoid target closure. And I'm not able to see any obvious lesion there. There is peritoneal enhancement, which is more appreciated in the and, uh, No obvious uh, mass movement in the bowel that I'm able to see. Uh, okay. Stomach appears clear. So, uh, uh, in the coronal sections which have been provided, in yeah. the chart, I can just barely make out there's some lymph nodes in the subcarinal region, perhaps. I'm, I'm not sure. It's, it's not so well in the active sections. Yeah. Um, so, uh, together, uh, there, 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 is, there is some mediastinal lymph lymphopathy, there's some enlarged infradiaphragmatic lymph nodes. There is a peritoneal thickening, grossositis, and uh, uh, multiple hypertonating lesions in the liver and one in the kidney. Uh, this could all fit in the infective spectrum one. Uh, and again, TB, TB could be a differential with the liver lesions being multiple liver granuloma and the kidney lesion also being involvement of the kidney by, by a tubercular. Yeah. Could be a, a primary malignancy, and then those hypoatenating lesions in the liver could be metastatic required for the workup. So okay. uh, those are my two differentials. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I agree. Um, we haven't got the axial chest images, but you're right. There are what look like abnormal abnormally enlarged lymph nodes in the subcarinal space um, in the thorax. And then the abdominal findings are, again, very similar to what we've seen already. So we see ascites, we see nodular thickening of the omentum, so just generally increased density throughout in a streaky fashion, thickening of the peritoneum, and that extends all the way down into the and pelvis. And this is a male patient. Um, and so when we're faced with this kind of situation, um, remember that the 
commonest abdominal organs, which are the primary source of peritoneal carcinomatosis, are stomach, pancreas, uh, colon, um, also look at the distal esophagus. So they all have to be scrutinized very carefully to see if there's any mass there that could be the primary source. But we also need to be considering infections like tuberculosis. And again, on this particular um, CT, there is nothing here that will point to you definitively to one or the other, tuberculosis or peritoneal carcinomatosis. Now, you did mention these liver lesions, and I agree there are multiple ill-defined low-density lesions within the, the liver, which could be metastases. But in fact, this is also what um, hepatic involvement by tuberculosis can look like. You can have a micronodular form and sometimes they're very difficult to see, but sometimes they're larger nodules and this is exactly how they'll show up, ill-defined low-density lesions. Um, they can also involve the spleen and in fact here in the spleen there is a focus of low density just there which is poorly defined um, and another one just over here. So um, this was in fact biopsy proven hepato uh, splenic TB and peritoneal TB as well. The important point is that you need to think about that differential and provide it and therefore that the specimens can be sent off for the appropriate analysis to make that diagnosis. Okay, who wants to do case number four? Case number four is a really quick one because we've just got a few still images to, to describe. Yeah, I can do it if you want. Okay. You can hear me. Yeah, I can. Um, cool. So this is um, case four. So case four is actually a 12-year-old um, girl who had non-specific symptoms and a palpable uh, cervical lymph node. And I've got a few, um, just a few individual CT slices for you from the thorax and abdomen. Um, and because of the history and the age, the working diagnosis was essentially to do a workup for a hematological malignancy, which is why the CT was done. So what do you see? Yeah, so several uh, axial slices of both the abdomen and chest described. We've been given both oral and IV contrast. Um, so the first axial slice uh, shows quite diffuse uh, peritoneal thickening um, and modularity. There's also several uh, lymph nodes uh, throughout the abdomen. Um, I know that there's some oral contrast within some bowel, I'm presuming that's a bit of large bowel, so oral contrast will probably re re reach some of the, the hepatic flexure. Um, the second image um, there, as, as noted previously, is diffuse uh, mental thickening. Um, I don't think there's, I mean, of note, there's no gross societies that I can see. Um, the third image, uh, this is, uh, again, on contrast in the portal venous phase. Uh, we've got a section of, a short segment of, what looks like terminal ileum, which is quite diffusely thickened. Um, presume it'd be circumferentially thickened in nature uh, and has sort of a, a nodular appearance. Um, I'd also be specifically looking for any peritoneal enhancement. So if we flip back to the slide before, I can't see any, uh, possibly any subtle, there may be some subtle hyper enhancement of the peritoneal lining, which suggests a bit of inflammation. Um, and then the two axial slices of the chest, um, you've got uh, low attenuation uh, right hilar node. I can't see any, I presume that's not, not a PE and, and therefore it's, it's going to be a hilar node. Um, and there's also a subcarinal uh, node as well, which is enlarged. So in the context of this being quite a young patient, um, the main findings of uh, uh, terminal ileum thickening, uh, a diffuse peritoneal uh, mental thickening and nodularity. Um, I mean, my main differential would be uh, a hemopathic disorder, like you mentioned. The other things would be t uh, TB uh, peritonitis, given the the, the hyaline nodes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So I agree that um, there is again this diffuse abnormality of the um, peritoneum and omentum within the abdomen. Um, slightly different this time there's much more it looks much more thicker than the previous cases there's a very large volume of um, soft tissue here causing thickening of the omentum 
And as you say, there's a relative lack of ascites compared to the previous ones that we saw. So yeah, we haven't got slices all the way down to the pelvis, but within the slices, we can see there isn't very much ascites. And then in the chest, there's this abnormal lymphadenopathy in the right hilum and subcarinal um, region. So once again, this was biopsied and this was also confirmed to be a case of tuberculosis, um, um, but with a slightly different appearance to it than on the previous ones that we've seen. Um, right, so this is the next one, case number five. Mm -hmm. So this is a 45-year-old female who has got abdominal pain and weight loss, so really non-specific symptoms. And again, you've got CT in three planes. So can you describe what you're seeing? So if we start with the basis of the lung, she's got a moderate left-sided pearl effusion. And then as we scroll through, she's also got scoliosis yep. and ascites, most of the fluid in her pelvis. She's got some peritoneal nodularity. Okay. I'm not sure there's some momentum thickening there too. Okay. Um, <clears throat> going on the theme of the previous CTs. Yeah. Um, well, I guess one of the differentials would be whether she's got disseminated TB or a primary malignancy. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, absolutely, we're following the theme and. Um, Essentially, as you said, from the top, we start and we see there's a very large um, left pleural effusion. But then again, abnormal ab ab um, findings below the diaphragm. So we've got ascites, but just thinking back to our previous two cases, the ascites here is in pockets scattered throughout the abdomen rather than um, dispersed freely as we saw in the previous cases. Again, we've got a mental thickening. There's a bit of um, motion artifact, which means the images are slightly obscured, but there is thickening of the omentum, which is high in density, and uh, there's also subtle increased density of the fat just immediately deep to it. But the thickening isn't as pronounced as on the previous cases. We've also got thickening of the peritoneum, which we see, particularly when you look down in, towards the lower part of the abdomen and pelvis, you see this nodular thickening of the peritoneal lining. And then the small bowel mesentery again is nodular. Um, it's got these small high density nodules scattered throughout. Okay, So yes, again, you must consider the differential of carcinomatosis or TB. Examining examining all those organs carefully that we know are responsible for disseminated carcinomatosis, so the ovaries, the stomach, the pancreas, um, looking at the small and the large bowel. Um, but the uh, differential of tuberculosis should be offered, and then at least the biopsy specimens can be sent off for the appropriate analysis to make sure that tuberculosis is considered as well. And in fact, this was once again, a um, biopsy proven case of peritoneal tuberculosis. So when you look at the literature, what you'll find is that um, when they describe peritoneal TB, there's three different patterns that are described and we've just been through all that spectrum. So let's just recap. So there is first of all, um, what's described as the wet type in which there is a very large volume of ascites. It can be high in density, unlike what you see in, for example, liver disease. It can be high density and that's because of the high protein content. Um, and it can be diffuse or it, it can be loculated into small compartments. And then there is what's known as the fibrotic um, or fixed fibrotic type of peritoneal TB in which there are these thick mental masses, thickening of the mesentery, matting together of bowel loops because of this fibrotic process. And then that fibrosis um, makes the kind of ascites be loculated into different compartments. And then finally, there's the dry type of peritoneal tuberculosis in which there isn't very much ascites, and if there is, it's um, uh, in small pockets. There is a lot of um, adenopathy with central necrosis around the place, and we're going to look at some of that soon. Mesenteric nodularity, peritoneal thickening nodularity, and also a mental thickening. But generally speaking, 
this pattern is um, characterized by paucity of ascites. Now, as you'll imagine, that actually there's a great overlap between all of these, okay? And it's not particularly useful when you're reporting to try and fixate and and um, focus on which particular type of uh, perishable TB this is because there is so much overlap of uh, of the findings. So the main thing is understand what the different range of features are and describe them and at least consider that tuberculosis is a possibility. Don't worry too much about labeling it into dry, wet or fibrotic types. Cool. So case number six is a 40 year old man who's got this vague chest and abdominal pain and weight loss. And there's a concern that he's got disseminated malignancy. So he's um, been sent for a CT chest, abdomen and pelvis. So you've got chest and abdominal axial um, images. You've got coronal and sagittal images of the whole body. And yeah. the axial um, uh, series of the chest also is a lung window. Yeah. So can you describe okay. what you see? Yeah. So I'm going to start with the axial lung. Um, yeah. So starting with the portal venous. Um, and I'm just looking at the mediastinum and I see some just small volume um, lymph nodes, uh, mediastinal lymph nodes, um, and uh, an enlarged subcarinal lymph node as well. Okay. Um, there's nothing more in the mediastinum, so just moving to the axial lung window. Um, and in the right apex, um, there is some um, increased nodular opacities or consolidations. Yeah. Um, and then just um, in the right lower lung, uh, there is some tree and bud nodularity, such so as in the peripheral. Or this, yeah. Okay. Um, and apart from that, the lungs are otherwise clear. I think. Okay. Um, and now moving to the abdopelvis. Yeah. Um, the axial abdopelvis. Mm -hmm. um, so the I think the main thing that um, stood out was there is some, I'm not really sure whether this goes with the story, but um, the head of the pancreas looks a bit bulky and there's focal or like localized lymphadenopathy surrounding that. Okay. Um, but there is no, so it doesn't really follow the theme of the rest of the um, cases. There's no ascites. Um, there's no um, like uh, intra-abdominal collections or lymphadenopathies uh, or other lymphadenopathy. The liver is okay. And the remaining abdominal viscera are are unremarkable really okay that's mainly it um, um so i don't know um it just doesn't really follow the theme or the story but some differentials could be i'd like to rule out pancreatitis maybe although it doesn't really look like that <laughs> um okay. What about when you um, review the sagittal um, plane? Did you see anything? So he had an. Uh, uh, I can also see an MRI spine that he's had. Okay, yeah. Let's go to the MRI. So that's the next um, study. Yeah. So what do you see on the MRI? So at the level of probably like T six T seven, there's an intramedullary um, mass like lesion that's T1 dark and um, bright on stair. I'm not okay. really sure to be honest what that um, lesion is, uh, that mass lesion is. Okay, what do you think it's doing to the... Um... It's causing a mass effect and... Cord, yeah. uh, yeah, it's compressing the cord at that level. Okay, so what's your kind of overall final impression or differential for the whole case? Um, so it's um, 
because uh, we are going by the theme, but TV does weird things, so it could be TV. Um, there's like separate things going on in the abdomen, the, the, the spine, and the lungs. Yeah. Um, I'm not really thinking this is malignancy, so in fact, infections such as TB or an inflammatory process of some kind. Okay, fine. And how would you progress the case? What would um, you do as the next thing? Um, you probably want to try and get some tissue from somewhere. I guess, yeah, that's and... what I'm thinking about. Which part, maybe? <laughs> the, the, um, I mean, obviously, the ma mass, uh, the spine, probably the first. The yeah. First okay. All right. Thank you. Let Let me just let's talk through the um the findings. Okay. So, as you um, we'll go from the top. So let's start with the lungs. So remember that he's a relatively young man. He's got vague symptoms and there's quite a few different findings here. So he's got this nodularity at the apex of the right lungs and the right upper lobe. And then also some changes here within the right lower lobe. We go to the soft tissue windows and we see that actually there's quite a lot of lymphadenopathy. So here, right paratracheal, there's some abnormal lymph nodes. Um, within the mediastinum, again, just lower down, there's some abnormal lymph nodes. Centrally, subcarinely, there's some abnormal lymph nodes. We get down to the, uh, we go to the abdomen, and then we see that actually throughout his spleen, there are these ill-defined low-density nodules, lots and lots of ill-defined um, small nodules throughout the spleen. As you said that around the pancreatic head, it looks abnormal, but the pancreas itself has a normal appearance, but it is surrounded by lots of lymph nodes. So peripancreatic lymphadenopathy in the retroperitoneum, in the aortocaval space here to the left of the aorta, there are many abnormal lymph nodes. And then we come down and in the iliocolic, distal iliocolic mesentery, there are larger abnormal lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes have a low density in the center. This is a really important finding for this case. They've got low density in the center. And then there's an abnormal appearance to the cecum and to the terminal ilium. Um, and if we look at the coronal images in particular, you can see that the cecum is particularly thickened, but in particular, the medial wall of the cecum is asymmetrically thickened compared to the uh, rest of it. So it's not a circumferential thickening. The medial wall is um, favorably involved. And then the coronal views are really helpful to see that um, the marked lymphadenopathy. So you see all these large lymph nodes in the distal iliocolic mesentery, in the periparancreatic region, um, around the portohepatis as well. Okay. And then when we look at the sagittal views, um, we haven't got bone windows, but we do appreciate there's some destruction um, of tissue up here in the mid thoracic region and the, an impression of some soft tissue density extending into the spinal canal. So if we look at the MRI, then that confirms that there is an epidural um, abscess here. Um, the signal is of a, of a collection um, and it's compressing the spinal cord. It's reducing the CSF space. Um, and there's also bone destruction. So the posterior elements of that particular thoracic vertebral body are, are destroyed. Okay, So this is a case of multi-system involvement. And this was biopsy proven tuberculosis. So we've got lung involvement, lymphadenopathy, ileocecal involvement, splenic involvement, and also bone disease. Um, as well. So um, the just to uh, reflect on lymphadenopathy for a second. So we know that in TB you can get these enlarged lymph nodes. Characteristically, they have low density center because of caseous necrosis and the periphery will look um, slightly dense. So uh, an example here, can you see this lymph node? It's got the a peripheral um, dense component and centrally it's low in density. Typical places in the abdomen, port hepatis, peripancreatic, and small bowel mesentery. It's actually relatively um, less common to get retroperitoneal lymph nodes compared to, for example, what we see in malignancy. In this case, there were quite a few enlarged retroperitoneal lymph nodes. 
And then the other aspect of abdominal TB that we've seen in this case is bowel involvement. Okay, so the commonest site is the ileocecal region. And sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate ileocecal TB from Crohn's disease. These are pragmatically speaking, the two main differentials that we have to think about. So how can we um, differentiate between them? So ileocecal TB typically involves the cecum and asymmetrically, so the medial wall is favoured. In the chronic phase, you get fibrosis, you get retraction of the cecum, which gets pulled up the abdomen. Look for adjacent necrotic lymph nodes, and obviously if you've got signs of TB elsewhere, that's a really helpful feature. Crohn's disease is more likely to be symmetric involvement. Look for signs of pseudosaculation involving segments of the small bowel. So this is where you have um, fibrosis on the mesenteric side, which means you get this abnormal dilatation on the opposite side. Um, look for fistulation um, and vascular congestion. Those are all features of Crohn's disease. Ultimately, you may need a biopsy to be absolutely certain which one it is. Um, and so just to wrap up the things around TB, the, what I would just say is um, you have to have it in your mind to be able to raise the possibility when you're reporting. So the things to consider are the clinical presentation and demographics. Remember all those points I uh, mentioned earlier. Think about the, the age, um, where the patient's from, think about socio, um, social risk factors, whether they're immunosuppressed. Um, and then look for the particular imaging features that we that I've described. So the peritoneal features of TB, bowel involvement, lymphadenopathy. And then if you raise the possibility, then when a biopsy is taken, um, the appropriate sampling can be done to look for tuberculosis so you can start the appropriate treatment. Okay. So this is the final case, number seven. So this is a 70-year-old man presented with a ruptured appendix mucosal a year earlier and now um, is being sent in for a CT because he's got increasing abdominal distension. So what do you see on this scan? Uh, so, yeah, so these are axial slices of the abdomen and pelvis um, in the portal venous phase. Uh, it's quite gross abnormality throughout the uh, abdomen. There's low density um, pacification or a material within the abdomen causing distension. Um, there is evidence of scalloping of both the liver and the spleen. Um, and there is also extension of the low density material into uh, two large uh, bilateral inguinal hernias. I uh, note that there's some small foci of calcification uh, in the right inguinal hernia. Um, there's no uh, gross bowel obstruction. Um, we specifically looking in the right ehrlich fossa to see if there'd be any mass lesion uh, there, which I can't see, probably because of the, the gross amount of distension. Um, and the coronal slices, um, I don't think it adds any further information. The remaining abdominal viscera, uh, a couple of tiny cysts in the, in the upper pole of the left kidney. Um, okay. So, yes, yeah, so overall, um, I mean, the main findings are of this quite gross, uh, well, and yeah, sorry, in addition, there's also uh, some mental caking as well, um, which is a very subtle uh, attenuation difference between the low density material and the omentum. So yeah, in summary, this is a, a gross abnormality within the bowel. There's evidence of sca scalloping of the liver and a, a diffuse low density material in the context of the patient having a previous mucosal that's ruptured. Um, my main differential would be a pseudomyxoma peritone. Uh, for, for further management, um, I think this patient needs staging, um, particularly of the, so completion imaging of the chest. Um, and given the, the extent of disease, uh, we'll need appropriate referral to a, a tertiary center I think in the UK, uh, there are two centers that particularly deal with pseudomyxoma, um, yeah. but there's particular treatments that, that they can do yeah. um, for these, one of which is peritoneal stripping. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I agree. Yeah. So throughout the abdomen here, we have a very large volume of um, fluid density, so actual fluid. Um, but also this other lower density material here, which is thickening of the omentum. It's not quite as dense as we've seen on the perishnal TB and perishnal carcinomatosis cases, but it's definitely abnormal. And as you said, there's like very marked distension. The abdomen's distended like a drum. The fluid extends into the inguinal hernia bilaterally. There are foci of calcification. So here on the right side, um, we see that um, in the right 
uh, flank here we see another focus as well and um, there's also like you said the scalloping of the surface of the liver okay so this is subcapsular disease which is indenting the surface of the liver and we see that on the left on the surface of the spleen as well so this is pseudomyxoma peritoneae which is a result of the previous um, ruptured appendiceal um, malignancy so it's a um, disease where there's a large volume of mucin producing tissue within the abdominal cavity and then there's a large volume of mucin as a result most commonly because of an appendiceal um, tumor which may be benign or malignant in itself so we know that in his case he had a previous um, appendix lesion causing a mucosal the mucosal ruptured when it ruptures you get dispersion of the cells throughout the abdominal cavity so even if an appendicectomy is performed at the time it may be that patients present sometime later with signs of pseudomyxoma peritoneae there's a variable cellular content within it so it may be that it's predominantly mucin rather than cellular look for scalloping of the liver and you'll um, see occasional scattered calcification throughout the abdominal cavity as a sign okay all right thank you very much